good to be in the house of the Lord. Yes. Even though I realize that I am the house of the Lord because the Spirit dwells with me and our houses can come together. Sure. The Spirit can move from breast to breast. We can be encouraged by His Spirit together. We need each other. Yes. And today as we start a new sermon series, it's up on the board here, it's to be revived by His reign. Today is a preparation for the series. And that preparation is preparing the field. All throughout Scripture, we are likened to gardens, sun-scorched, withered, dry, that needs to be desperately watered by rain. The Bible says that God reigns on the just and the unjust. We equally all need something from outside of ourselves that has to come from God and God alone. And what a privilege and a grace it is, whether you're in the house of God or you find yourself as an outcast outside of God in his love, he still reigns on the just and the unjust. But because we are his, we need to know that we can continuously be revived. That even as a Christian, times become dry, weary, burdened, and even thorns and thistles can grow, and he is quick to revive and cleanse. And when you go to garden, one of the first things you do is you begin to break ground. So we want to break ground. Psalms chapter 103 and verses 8 through 14 will kind of be this opening, breaking ground verse to exemplify the character and the nature of God. If we're going to be revived, it's got to be because God is willing to revive and who is the God that is willing to revive? Well, notice Psalms 103. And we'll say this prayerfully. prayerfully. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. And Father, we're thankful that you are gracious to us. It tells us that you are slow to anger and you abound towards us. Sinners and loving kindness, that you will not always strive with us, that there will be a day of reckoning, there will be a day of judgment, and nor will you keep this anger that you are keeping back now for the sake of Christ. You will not keep that forever. And Lord, we're thankful that you are keeping it for now. That you have not dealt with us according to our <coughs> sin, for there are many. Nor have you rewarded us according to our iniquities. And we know that as high as the heavens are above the earth, for those of us who fear you, for your loving kindness towards us is great. Lord, the transgressions that befall us, even this morning, you will remove them so far, it tells us, as far as it is from the east is from the west. Remove. For just as we have recognized in this life from fathers, mothers, friends, companions, that we have received compassion as children, your compassion is great. And you understand our frame. You're mindful that we are just but dust. That is the God that pursues us. That is the God, as we sung this morning, is willing to overwhelm us with his love, that we may be captured by this love. This God who can be angry and will fulfill his justice at one point in time in the future. All who will not receive the Lord Jesus Christ will be judged according to his justice, which is pure and holy. God is holy, holy, holy. Now he comes to capture, to pursue, and patiently he waits for a people who cries out for him. You know, I woke up Tuesday. I was surprised. I woke up early in the morning on Tuesday. As much as I tried to fight it and say it wasn't, I was sick. I woke up dry. My nose was dry. My eyes, my face felt like no moisture. 
I thought, well, it's that time of the year again where we need a humidifier. That's all it is. Got up, got a drink. For good measure in our house, we use apple cider vinegar. I took a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar just to make sure. But when I woke up again to go to work, I was sick. But I noticed something. When I got into the shower, everything immediately opened up. Moisture came back into the body. I was still sick. I knew I needed to recover. But the moisture, the wetness that came inside of me relieved. But you know what? I'm a craftsman. And a lot of times we like to do things for ourselves. So, of course, I, I brought my craftsman bag. Let me tell you something I learned this week. Tuesday morning, I woke up sick and I said, I want to be the Ryan of Monday. The Ryan of Monday felt better. The Ryan of Monday was able to get up and go to work and do the things that were required of him. The Ryan of Monday was a husband who could come home and be attended to his wife and was a father that could play and be concerned about the children. And he was able to do the things that he needed to do. But Tuesday, Ryan was sick. And a lot of those things he didn't really care about. And if I could just get back to Monday, Ryan, all things would be okay. So I started investing energy, time, and money in getting back to Monday, Ryan. So here's some of the things that I did just to show you how we try to fix things. Of course, I told you that I got up and took the shower and I took the apple cider vinegar. Wonderful thing. Do some research on it if you'd like to. But apple cider vinegar, that's my front line of defense. We are supposed to take it every day, but you neglect. And then all of a sudden when the ailments come, I, I oh, I better take my apple cider vinegar. And then I, my throat was kind of raspy, so I stopped at the store and spent some money on some halls. I don't have very many left, but I have halls because I needed to be able to talk and to communicate my throat was sore. So I got the halls and when I wasn't sucking down on halls, I thought, well, you know what, I, I better take these zinc lozenges because zinc will help revive the body and bring health back. So halls, zinc, halls, zinc, I, this constant repetitive, oh, I'm not sucking on anything. I need to get something for my throat and I was doing that and and then the Tuesday night, I, I came home and I thought, man, I got to get over this. So I stopped at the store and bought the NyQuil. Took the NyQuil to help me not only sleep through the night so that I may wake up rested, as the commercial says, but I needed some relief. But you know what's interesting is all that does is relieve symptoms. It doesn't cure anything. All it is is telling me that you're sick and we can relieve that while you can sleep. So I, I took. I took that and we got the humidifier out and then I had to invest and spend the time in the camphor oil that you put in the humidifier so the airways were open. A lot of time, a lot of energy and you know what, I woke up groggy from the NyQuil so I stopped because I got to be ready for work early. So I got the monster energy drink to get rid of the grogginess so that I could go to work and, and have energy and do my job. And then, of course, you know, electrolytes are important, so I got the Gatorade to make sure my fluids and liquids all trying to get back to Monday, Ryan. Now, here's what I believe the Spirit led me this week to realize is Monday, Ryan, was always going to be sick on Tuesday. I didn't need to be back at Monday, Ryan. I needed to be a different Ryan. I needed to get healthy and get well. Monday, Ryan, would only bring Tuesday sickness anyways. The symptoms that I had on Tuesday were already developing on Monday. Now, follow this closely. The relationship that you had with the Lord on Monday isn't enough to get you by on Tuesday. We're not Christ yet. And we're moving towards Christ-likeness. And the Ryan of last week is not the Ryan that God desires that I would remain. And we spend so much time and energy. If I could get one more Bible study, if I could read one more book, things don't seem the same. If I could get back to where I was two months ago, where I felt the presence of the Lord, and I felt adequate, and I felt vitality within myself. If I could go back, and God says, no, Monday Ryan is not going to cut it anymore. Sickness came for a reason. Choices now have to be made. What is it that you're putting into your body? Are you getting enough rest? 
Are you doing the things required of you to stay healthy? That's why sickness comes. That's why in the Christian life, affliction comes. And we talked about how the Bible relates to us as gardens. And if we're going to be revived, if we're going to see the rain, there's things that have to happen every year. Whether or not you're just an, a hobbyist gardener or a commercial floor, full-blown commercial farmer, the first thing that we have to do is survey the soil and be honest. If we're going to make the investment in hopefully a harvest, a crop, we have to first survey the soil. Every year you got to do that. We need to know if the texture of the soil is right. Is the soil fertile? Is there enough moisture? How are the pH levels? All of those things are critical to success. And when we begin to survey the soil, we can begin to make amendments. There's not enough fertilizer. The pH balance has to come up. This is more like clay. So here's the question. If I was willing, which I am this morning, if you and I were willing to take a sample of the soil of our heart, is this the soil that you would want? Let me take it a step further. For anybody who is a parent, is this the soil I would want to offer my children? Dry, probably no life to be had in that. And if I was going to be honest before the Lord who sees me as I really am, am I willing to present this soil to Him? And the answer for me is no. Do I love the Lord? Yes. Am I saved? Yes. Am I satisfied with the Lord? Yes, but not with how much of the Lord I'm willing to take. Because the more I take of the Lord means the less of myself. The less I depend on myself. The less I am trying to invest in being the me that I want to be. That I feel like I need to be. The soil is junk when I choose to rely upon myself and not the Lord. Take a sample of your heart this morning and we can move forward. Now when we survey the soil and we find out that it may be adequate for a little bit of growth, but we want growth. We want what we can have, what we've been told we are able to have. I want all that I can have and then some. I don't know that I would be overwhelmed by the crop that my soil would provide right now. But when God gets a hold of it, when God tills it, when I decide to put my hands to the plow and not look back, watch out. And when I find out that my soil needs to be repaired or amended, I need to begin to solicit instruction. So we have surveyed the soil and we need to solicit instruction. Our pastor, who is not here today, has tried over the last couple of years to have a garden. And the first year was okay. But he wanted to solicit instruction from who? Someone in the neighborhood who had had a successful garden. He found that man, and that man gave him tips. He solicited instruction. Where does a Christian want to solicit instruction from? The scriptures and the scriptures alone. Rightly divided and discerned. Because the Spirit is willing to quicken and teach truth. So notice our verse for the series, if you will, comes from Hosea chapter 6. Wonderful book. First of the minor prophets. Hosea 6, chapter 6, 1 through 3. Come, let us, that's you and me, let's make a decision. Let's be in agreement. Let us return to the Lord. You can't return if you hadn't first been there. Okay? So we've been there. But then we began to rely on ourselves. Come, let us together return to the Lord. Notice what it says. For he has torn us. But he will heal us. The Lord never tears when he's not willing to heal. But he must tear first. I must be torn. Dayspring has been torn. 
the pastor and his wife have been torn and removed from our midst and they're recovering they're being healed while we too are being healed from what has been torn and he goes on and he says he has wounded us does God wound absolutely but why but he will bandage us he'll put that anointment on and bandage so that we may recover we may be revived he will revive us after two days he will raise us up on the third day that we may live where before him not before myself not before my family not so that I mean that I may have a, a right opinion in your heart about me that I may live right before him that's where I want to be right before him so notice this so let us know no let us press on to know the Lord his going forth is as certain as the dawn and he will come to us like what like rain like the springs rain watering the earth he will revive us yes that's his promise Amen. much like he will tear us but he'll heal he will wound he will bandage these are promises these are the roads to being revived a lot of times we're not willing to be bruised afflicted torn or wounded but God says I must do these things first then comes healing then comes reviving then comes raising, then comes restoring. I want that. I want that. And I want that for us. And let me give you a little background on Hosea so we aren't just ripping this completely out of context. Hosea is the first of the minor prophets, and it was during a time where the kingdom was divided. Now at the same time, Hosea is preaching. Now he preached for 80 years. The same message for 80 years and the stiff neck Israelites just never seemed to get it and while he was preaching over here on this region Micah was preaching and over here uh, Isaiah was preaching now Isaiah was a mighty man and you know this because of all of the attention paid to him in scriptures look at all of the room in the Bible Isaiah got it's a time in which God wanted to revive his people Three prophets preaching the same message. Now notice, if we were going to sum up Hosea and his message that he preached, first, God made him an example to the people. Hosea, you will call upon me and you will proclaim my word to the people. But first, marry this woman who is a harlot. She will be a harlot. Yes, because my people are a harlot. My people are adulterous. My people are finding they didn't ever stop worshiping. Notice this. Israelites lost contact but not commitment. The Israelites didn't stop worshiping. They just started worshiping other things. The Israelites didn't stop listening to teaching. They just started listening to teaching that corrupts. The Israelites didn't stop being religious. They became a religious of perversion. They lost contact, but not commitment. Many of us are committed to religious activities that produce nothing. In fact, they take away. They take away from our contact from God. Now, here's the bullet point theme of Hosea. God persistently pursues his people. Even, even when they don't love him, yes. Even when they pursue false gods, absolutely. Even when they are adulterous, yes. God pursues with patience his people. Now when his people are persistently pursuing the creation instead of the creator, God is in the midst, drawing them back to himself. But notice this. What in the world does that have to do for me and my dry soil today? God does not change. 
what he tried to communicate to a stiff-necked, rough-necked, idolatrous group of people. Way back in the day, he's trying to communicate to you and me. I will pursue you. I will capture you. I will follow after you. I will put up hedges. I will make sure that commerce in the city is no longer there just so you will return to me. That's the God that we serve and who loves us and who is calling us to return. Does he come back just to judge and to smite? No, to love and to open arms and to revive. Why? As we read in the first psalm, is he is mindful of our frame that we are just but dust. And that is why I'm corruptible and this thing is just but perishing. But I must take on what is not perishing, not corruptible, the Lord Jesus Christ. And because he's unchanging, God will revive us. So when we solicit instruction, do we receive the instruction? Will we move into instruction? When the pastor went to the neighbor and said, my garden's not doing as well as I think I, it should do, what should I do? When the man gave him instruction, if the pastor said, that seems like a lot of work, I'm not going to do that. Soliciting instruction paid no dividend to him. It offered him nothing. We must then submit to instruction. When I go to the scriptures and I'm soliciting, Lord, how do I get revived? Revive me, Lord. I'm soliciting. I'm seeking so that I may find. And when I find, I fall in love with you. I then submit to the instruction. In fact, instruction given by the Lord that's not submitted to, how horrible is that? And we're all guilty of that. But I must first say that my soil needs to be revived. That's the first step. I've got to say, you know what, the soil's worthless. And really, honestly, I am. Without the Lord, without His presence, without His hand, without His salvation, I'm worthless. That soil is a lot like that rag. It's filthy. Even if the Word was planted into it, the thorns and the thistles and the rocks and the shallowness would choke it out. It's got to be ripped down low in order for it to produce. Notice this. Notice Job. Here's some hope for you. Job 14, 7 through 9. For there is hope for a tree. All right, so a lot of you may not have branches and leaves, but let's just run with that. You're like a tree. You're planted. You're rooted. But notice this. There's hope for a tree when it is cut down. Ouch. That it will sprout again. Notice what it says there. And its shoots will not fail, though its roots grow where? Old in the ground. Now, we ought to get the concept that the ground in which the tree was planted in wasn't very good. What I'm putting my hope, my trust, my faith in, if it's my family, if it's my friend, it's my social status, my job, if it's my even my religious affiliation, that ground has nothing for me. All that's fading away too. That tree's got to be cut down, but then God will do something. He will produce a shoot in that stump. And the soil can become changed. It goes on. And he says, the stump then dies in the dry soil. All that I found and put all my work, all my security, all my stability in will fail me. Because God will come in and just cut it down. It's worthless. The axe is already laid at the tree. He will cut it down. But what he cares, he will heal. The shoe comes forth. And notice what it says. At the scent of water, it will flourish and put forth springs like a plant. If you're a tree today, you're willing that God will cut you down. He will heal. He will spring forth a shoot and water that with the Holy Spirit. And we move then from just 
recognizing that the soil must be revived, and we have hope that God will do that. But notice this, submitting then is really just an agreement. Submitting, being obedient is an agreement. Yes, God, that is what's best for me. That's not hindering me. That's not putting a gate around me. That's not putting me in the bondage. No, that's freedom. That's liberation. What you're asking me to be obedient to, there's nothing greater, and I just agree with that. Submission is agreement with what God has said. So, before we go any further, do we agree that on some level we need personal revival? Yeah. I, I believe that. And I believe that because my field interlocks with your field because we are a congregation, then if my field is dry... Even if yours is somewhat flourishing, because we're not together, I'll suck the life out of yours. Or you'll suck the life right out of mine. Because we move forward together. If your field's weak, I'm bearing that burden too. Mine then is weak and needs to be revived. So if we're in agreement that we, at some level, need personal revival, then we're also in agreement that we need congregational revival. Because I'm going to tell you this, the church's responsibility besides worshiping and giving glory to God first and foremost is to bring those who are not in Christ to Christ. Not to fulfill any of our needs and, and, and to like everything about the church. Those things are so petty in comparison to what our responsibility is is to bring those outside inside into Christ so re personal revival is congregational revival and congregational revival is community revival so revival is an agreement that first notice this we're not going to spend any time on what revival is not Revival has been made into a circus a lot of times. We're going to spend time on what revival is. Now here's revival. First and foremost, it's an agreement that God pursues you and me. Revival can only begin with God. And it can only begin that He first pursues. He desires to capture. He desires to revive. And because we've already established that, Revival is an agreement that the God that I've either offended or I think is going to be angry at me or I think that I'm worthless before or I think must not love me anymore, that that's a sham. That God is patiently and persistently pursuing you and me. So revival always begins with the fact that God is a pursuing God. Now notice this. That awareness does two things. The first thing is a refreshed revelation. Whatever I've done, wherever I've put roots, wherever I've let my mind wander, wherever I've let my deeds go, whatever I've let my heart, whatever I've set before my eyes that's corrupted me, no matter what those things are, the revelation that God is pursuing you and me fervently refreshes revelation of God. When I move out, when I lose contact, I start getting a smaller and smaller and smaller view of God. But when something happens, either affliction or being torn or being wounded, I realize God is pursuing me and revelation is restored. It's refreshed. And because of that, here's the second thing that revival does. Renewed regard. You see, I got myself off the path because I started getting a smaller view of God, which means I didn't hold him in a very high regard. Why would we pursue other gods? Because all of a sudden, they seem to have something that God didn't have. You see, sin, ultimately, is you and I trying to fulfill a legitimate need, but in the wrong way. Going after the wrong thing. God, you're not doing it for me. Maybe this will. And my regard of God, and he begins to grow small. 
inside me and something else begins to grow larger and I pursue that but when I have a refreshed revelation I have a renewed regard and you cannot leave today without me saying it even again God is pursuing you yes amen. and me thank you Lord that you pursue yes hallelujah thank you Okay, so I've solicited some instruction, and I've decided, you know, it's time. I, I just need to submit. You know what, Lord? There are things in your words I do not like. In fact, if I was honest, there are things I hate. I don't like them because they reveal a lot of things about me, and I like to think highly of myself. I want my name in big lights. Yeah. And when I read your word, I find out how small I am. I find out how unworthy I am. I find out how much I fail. I find out how much I'm inadequate. And I don't like that, but I've solicited you, Lord, and I'm willing to now submit, Lord. So then the solution is always by the Scripture alone. The solution can only come by Scripture. Now notice a couple things about revival. The first thing is that revival has to have a beginning. And we talked a little bit about that. But revival begins with a redirecting of instruction. I'm going to tell you this. If you're not in your Bible, you're being instructed somewhere else. Whether you have gone out and bought a book specifically, or you just listened to the ideas and the thoughts of man, you're being instructed daily. So revival begins with being redirected in instruction. And that comes from Scripture. Notice what Psalms 119, 105 says. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. We sing that song all the time. But what is that really saying? Well, today, the day that revival begins, is the day that we say, I'm redirecting my instruction because it's the lamp that will guide me. It's your light that sets my feet on the right path. It's not Cosmo magazine. It's not People's magazine. It's not the 6 o'clock news. It's not the mosque down the street. It's not the Scientologist church on Kingston Pike. It's not even really this church. It is the Word of God and the Word of God alone. You could be a part of a church and the Word of God not be lifted high and barely open. This is the church that will preach the Word of God and make all men liars. So it's a redirecting of instruction. Now, notice this from Psalms 119, 107. Continuing with revival. I am exceedingly afflicted. Lord, my soil. I'm dry. I'm barren. I'm lifeless. I don't have the nutrients. I'm not adequate to produce life. I'm afflicted. Lord, I'm either afflicted because of choices I've made, things I've done, things I've said, or even if people are afflicting me from the outside, I'm either afflicted from the outside or from the inside, I'm afflicted, revive me, the psalm says. I'm exceedingly afflicted, revive me, O Lord, according. Remember, solution is by scripture. I want to be revived, but I want it to be according to your word, your holy word. Affliction is the dry, arid land that cries out for rain. Notice this. Revival, after it is redirected, revival comes by a thirst. You ever heard the saying that if you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated? If you wait until you thirst for the things of God, you have a multitude of making up to do. You got to drink. You got to drink from the one who says, I will revive you. I will do it. Trust me. Place that faith in the fact that I will revive. 
Now, a revival sprouts where there is a reversal. So notice, there's a redirecting. There's a thirst, but then there's also a reversal. I'm going into redirecting of instructions, but then I need to reverse. Notice Psalms 119 again, 37 through 38. Turn away my eyes from looking at vanity. Okay, that's not keep me from keeping myself in front of the mirror. That's not what he's talking about. He's saying all of the pursuits of life that I eliminate God from is vain. It's futile. It's That word is vapor. It's just going to it either explode in my face or it, you know, it's just going to go away. And he says, keep my eyes from that. When I, when I see something sparkly in the sand and I get off the path to go after it and think that it's going to provide me the joy and the need and the want, all that I want, here it is over there and I get off the path. He says, keep my eyes from looking at vanity and the pride of life. And revive me to your ways. See, vanity is not the ways of God. And when my eyes get on those vain things in life, the psalmist is crying out, keep my eyes away from them. Revive me in your ways. Because I know that those ways, that your thoughts are so much greater than my thoughts. And your ways are greater than my ways. And these pursuits, like the ones in the past, have always failed me. You know, if we just look at history, I have rep there's one thing for sure is I have failed myself a multitude of times. I want to be established in his ways. Establish your word to your servant at that which produces reverence for you. You see, when I pursue the things of life, I revere myself. I'm on the throne. No, no, Lord. No, keep my eyes away from vanity. Revive me to your ways. Remember Proverbs, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of all wisdom. Reverence. Lord, I need reverence for you. You are mighty. You are king. I am not. Now revival then, after it sprouts, it flourishes when there is no resistance. Not outside resistance, not affliction, not trials, not tribulation. Those things will come. And you actually flourish because of those things. But revival flourishes when there's no resistance from you. When we just, just simply submit to what God is doing, revival is on its way. Being revived is on its way. When there is no resistance. Let's look at Psalms again. Psalms 80, 18 through 19. Then we shall not turn back from you. Revive us. And we will call upon your name. I shall not turn my back from you. I'm not going to resist. I'm not going to be satisfied for a time and then run off. I'm not going to resist you anymore. Or revive us. Us. O Lord, God of hosts, restore us. And I love this. Cause your face, cause your face to shine upon us, and we will be saved. Man, I want, just like a son wants his father's countenance to be right on him in approval, in a loving manner. No son wants his dad's countenance down and angry and furrowed brow and even the turning of the face. I want I want God looking at me. Not right at me because that, because that would destroy me but through Christ. He sees Christ and because of Christ he accepts me and he loves me and he's for me and he wants to revive me. Well, we want to close but what's interesting about Closing is we're not done because revival is only beginning. Personal revival is it's only beginning, so it's really not closing, it's moving forward. I want to move forward. I, I don't want to talk today about reviving and then go about our week and, and we forget about it because work comes and life comes and duties come and responsibility. We're just moving forward into revival. 
you know, once I got my mind off of Monday Ryan, it wasn't until then that I was then ready to anticipate a new and improved, healthier Ryan. Monday Ryan wasn't the answer. You know, as great as I felt the day I got saved, going back to that week, that month, however that was, how long it was for you, however long the high was, that's not where we need to get back to. We need to go forward. Amen. If, if you were super excited about the Lord three months ago, yeah. wonderful, but you don't want to get back to that person because God's wanting us to move forward in our journey of beginning to be revived begins together. I'm committed to you. Will you commit to me? Yes. That God will revive us. It's not going back. It's being placed back on the path. But face forward. Moving forward. There's a reason why the rear view mirror is smaller than the windshield. Mm -hmm. If we spend too much time paying attention to what's behind us we're not paying attention to what's coming towards us those things need to be small for a reason you know what your past past sins past transgressions past thoughts past deeds past words past lies they're in the back God says I will revive you if you but ask to be revived if you will admit you need to be revived Revival is God placed back on the throne, and it begins now. If you agree with that, stand and we'll worship in front of